Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the Mayfair Investment Club e-series. My name is Tatiana Doronina. It's Friday, 1 p.m. in London, and we are about to start. Today, we're here to talk about the fixed income and an asset, class, uh, asset class disappearance. And I'm happy to introduce you to our speakers of today. Please meet Dirk Klisch, the partner and chief investment officer in Goldberg and Partner SA, and my co-host Samir Sarik, investor, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and a public speaker. Today, the session will last 50 minutes. The first part is around 12 minutes for Dirk to give the introduction talk. Then Samir will ask him questions, and the second part is for Q&A. As usual, I would like to encourage you to ask questions as we want to engage with audience. If you're asking a question, please specify either you address it to the particular panelist or it's a general question for all participants. The webinar will be recorded and will be available uh, on the Mayfair Investment Club YouTube channel later. Now, uh, let me ask the first question to, to Dirk. And it will be the general question. Um, it's about Dirk. Um, what is the fixed income investment today? And uh, what happens with the asset class? Thank you very much, Tatiana. Uh, I would say to, to answer your question, we shall go a couple of steps back and uh, understand where the, uh, the asset class and the yield has been, I would say, somewhere 20 years ago. I don't know if the audience has practice. Uh, I would like to orient the question. Uh, 10 year T bond 10 years ago, what was the yield? Surprisingly, we were around 6.8%. And if we go to Europe, we are going to imagine that the 10 year bond was around 5.7%, meaning uh, fixed income gave a fixed income to investors on a quarterly or half year basis. If we look today, the T-bond is yielding something like 0 0.86 and the German bond 10 years is negative yielding at 0.31%. So we uh, must say that the uh, income part of this class has disappeared. And this means simply one thing, that normal bond investors, which used to have a single A for three, four, five years in the past, today will receive zero, nil income, and may be lucky if they get back the invested capital over or after three, four, or five years. And this is what I would define as the start or the disappearance of an asset class, which from my understanding has an essential importance in the financial system. I would like to draw your attention to one very particular uh, issue which happened in uh, 2017. So we are very close to our times when Austria had a great idea, the government of Austria, in issuing the uh, world first 100 year expiring government bond. It was issued at 100 and wondering, wondering with the uh, interest rates coming down over time, uh, the, high, the highest price this bond hit was somewhere the uh, end, was this the end of 2020 when it touched 240, creating a yield to maturity of 0.9%. Don't worry, in the meantime, it came down. We are now around 175. What I want to say, whatever you do in the fixed income or in the credit department, be careful. Do well understand what you are doing, what you are investing in, and do not, do not, fall into the error of believing that what has been a single A bond and yielding four or 5% years ago, today may be compared to a single B rated bond, which today in our times is yielding between six and 7% or maybe even less. Because the risk profile below, the underlying risk is completely different. 
and uh, the return expectations are absolutely not okay with the underlying risk. So what can we do? We cannot change what Central Bank is doing. We cannot change the perception of uh, how the governments and also the central banks think to save the financial world, but we are allowed in not to follow this um, investment pandemic in purchasing whatever kind of bond coming out, feeling obliged to invest it. And this means simply one thing, we have to go back to our roots. Roots meaning to analyze companies, create our own ideas on small and medium companies, which may need some private placement bonds, where we are able to give an appropriate due diligence, fixing an appropriate risk return basis, and uh, have a good control on what we are doing. Of course, this means hard work, but this means also having ultimate care of our investors, of our private investors, which trust us and therefore allow us to manage their money. The discussion, the, uh, the item may change for investment funds, but even there, I don't think that they are changing too much because this painful asset class called fixed income, even for the um, funds, doesn't pay huge income anymore. So that there is a global problem of perception and especially on how to stockage the, the funds, the money, the cash, which is dropping in on a monthly or a quartile basis. And if we think even larger, we can imagine which pain is feeling a pension fund manager or an insurance company, which has the duty to pay a certain percentage point because they are linked to contracts. And uh, this is the, the less given and possible by entering in normal and just forget about investment grade bonds because they are not yielding anymore. So we have a conceptual problem. I cannot tell you forget bonds and just buy equities. But as a matter of fact, today we see the general equity markets speaking in the specific case on Standard & Poor, which is trading roughly 25, 27 percentage points based on the financial ratios above the long-term average. But we know that if we adopt a um, discounted dividend model, the fixed income is uh, most probably twice as expensive as the equity market seems to be. And therefore again, with fixed income in the traditional way as we knew it for the older audience, guys like me who are in the business since uh, several years, today's fixed income is not an opportunity. It is a risk, it is if you want the mother of all bombs, which earlier or later is supposed to blow up. And I tell you what, from my point of view, is ultimately the biggest problem. We have, since the pandemic started, through governments or central banks, generated only in the, o in the OECD countries, fresh debt of 17 to 19,000 billion. This pushed the uh, debt to GDP ratio up to around 135%. But especially, and this is what 
I would say kills me over time, is that the global world debt is hanging around 260,000 billion. And if we have some luck in 2020 and the global economy is reopening and we can speed up a little bit consumption, the GDP worldwide may hit something around 85,000 billion. It means simple that our debt to GDP ratio is over 3.2 times. And this means the, the uh, issued debt will never ever be able to be paid back. It simply can be rolled from one expiry to the next expiry. And of course, let's hope all the best that COVID-20, COVID-21 are not going to enter or may enter with another name in the next 10 or 15 years so that we have some space to recover the financial disaster over the recent weeks and months. Somebody uh, in the USA, sorry to say somebody, it's the CBO, the US Congressional Budget Office, is estimating that the um, macroeconomical damage will be 8,000 8, billion and it will last to at least 2025, meaning huge stress for all institutional who have to try in some way to go ahead and generating in some way income, but most probably will go to enhance their equity exposure because the bond market yields will stay around today's levels, meaning 0.8%, and not offering any kind of a consistent, pretty sure income for those investors. Um, I would mention one more thing. If the um, normal investor was expected to buy and hold them, today we can expect that the latest good yielding investment grade bonds are expiring or have expired. The solution for them may be moments like they have been in uh, 2018 when uh, Mr. Powell, without asking permission to Mr. Trump, allowed himself to hike interest rates. It was a disaster. The yield on the 10 year went up, spiked up to 3%. Mr. Trump declared Mr. Powell as the most, as the biggest enemy to the US population and to his government. At the end, with all the unrest in the financial system, we had to accept that Mr. Powell was losing his independent view and started to cut again the interest rates. But these six months of unrest in the bond market offered great opportunities, as well as the pandemic, unfortunately, and don't get me wrong, it's not to be cynic, but at the end, this total distortion in the bond market we are living, we are suffering, has also created huge opportunities to employ funds to invest in bonds, which are now giving to the investor a better return on invested capital, giving them some four, five, six, seven percent, depending on which timing you could achieve and depending on which expiry you choose on the, uh, on the, on the yield curve. And uh, what can I say? It's clear, we cannot all buy equities, but consider before you employ cash 
into the bond market, kindly consider alternatives before engaging with long-lasting investment grade or even worse, high yield bond. The global debt burden will be a pain over the next five, 10 years. The probability of enhancing default ratios in the whole sector is growing up. And we saw this already since uh, middle March when in the oil sector in the US, the default ratio spiked. It's not finished. Most probably it's going to be even worse over the next month, maybe years. So just do your job, analyze not only the part of income you are presumed to get, but especially, and uh, let me allow me to insist, especially understand the best manner, which risk you're going to expose the investor. Tatiana, how are we on the time schedule? Thank you. I think we have to jump in on the call now, uh, on, the, on the questions, Dirk. I, I just want to kick off with, uh, first, thank you for uh, joining the Mayfair Investment Club's uh, eTalk series. Uh, we're very excited to have you, as Tatiana said. Um, um, when you first came up with a title, uh, which I find rather controversial, because you, you're really talking about the disappearance of an asset class, and I know in our previous conversations, we established that uh, fixed income has very much become zero income, which defeats the whole definition of this financial instrument. Uh, how do you think that those that continue to believe in this financial instrument will perceive your notion that this uh, instrument is disappearing? When in actual fact, there's many financial advisors and bankers that are still selling uh, this uh, financial product to many of their clients and will probably find your, your sort of statement not just controversial, but derogatory and also against their own financial interests. So what would your answer to that be? Of course it doesn't or it didn't disappear de facto. But um, I, I have to judge whatever we do based on the presumed underlying risk. And it is for me simple, not acceptable, that just because I have a couple of millions on the cash account, I have to employ them uh, in a fixed income investment. I have first of all to value the alternatives because I have to service my investors. I don't have to clean up the cash account because it's yielding negatively in the Euro rim or in the Swiss franc rim, but I have to be cautious on what I'm purchasing over the next, which is going to suppose being with us for the next years. The issuers of bonds, of course they must place bonds because we have a huge flow coming from pension funds, from insurance premiums, fresh money which is, is being earned and not everybody can invest in stocks. But this doesn't mean, said the Dispartibus, that I have to employ my money immediately. Be patient. Wait the opportunity where you receive a true yield to maturity method of the underlying risk. The example, uh, the, the, I could do many examples, but it, I think it would, it would make exploding the, the time frame of, uh, of this presentation. But one of my mentors, when I've been young, young and smart, told me, Dirk, never ever touch a bond if in five year time, it yields you per year less than five or 6% investment grade understanding. And don't touch it if it, if it yields below nine to 10% if it is a high yield. There, there is a reason because the, 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 the probability that a high yield company which has to track a yield of 10, 11%, there are risks it's not going to survive over the next 10 years. But there are probabilities that with a project starting, kicking off, there will be revenue streaming that for the next three to five years they may pay it back. 
But if you pay the same, or if you get the same bond, single B rated or below, and it yields you 5%, means simply one thing, that the cal calculation of the base project from industrial point of view is not good, is not acceptable, because most probably the global margins of, the, of this project will be around 10, 12%, which is not enough. Okay? Samir, I don't hear you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Could I just move into one more question? I think yeah, please. Jana opens it to the floor. Um, you gave a rather pessimistic and gloomy outlook on the current uh, financial crisis, which I understand why, um, because it, it is tough and it's going to remain uh, being tough. But you also said that in every recession and every tough economical conditions, there are also many opportunities. Now, sure. as somebody whose job is to sell uh, what you believe in, to be the right uh, uh, so financial products for your clients. If I was a prospective investor looking to uh, deploy some of my hard earned cash or part of my uh, sort of uh, 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 stashed away cash uh, with, with the company that uh, you uh, run, uh, what would your advice be in terms of investing a few million bucks today? And where do you see opportunities outside of your own a realm of expertise uh, and why? Um, okay, uh, it depends essentially what this million of bucks you want to invest is going to last and how long time it wants to be invested and how fast it may be needed to be used for another scope. Uh, let's assume that who comes to me and uh, doesn't need the money for the next five years or seven years most probably I'm going to package a, a balanced growth oriented portfolio where I would have contracted opportunities like, uh, just to make an example, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not a gambler. I, I try to be as qualified investor as possible and to be very careful in selecting my, my, my names. But I would have started, for example, to, to buy some uh, of the 6.5% uh, Pemex 27 which in a certain moment was dropping from 110 previous pan uh, pandemic to uh, around 75 and is now trading 92. So this would have been a certain entry opportunity for them. Uh, and similar investments in the, in, the, in the oil and gas sector, with all respect to uh, diversifying the sectors, we would find much with a pretty okay um, return to risk rating. Furthermore, I would uh, definitely go for uh, quality growth stocks, but also for value stocks. And um, I think theme investments like um, internet security, like um, water treatment, like uh, cloud banking, uh, cloud um storage just not to say purchase microsoft i would say about, i would say purchase the basket okay um could be considered worth to be purchased without giving any kind of major uh, pure speculative tendons on the portfolio and there may be some opportunities which are may be hard to understand but why shouldn't I buy an ETF on uh, aircraft, on uh, airlines? Why shouldn't I buy uh, something in today's distressed environment in, uh, in certain banks? I think these opportunities with one, patience, two, not be afraid in seeing them in the next crisis dipping some 20 or 25%. Two, having enough reserves to relaunch and always respecting what are sector and country exposures. So that over time you create, and this is a process, the, the streamlining of a portfolio of an investment uh, of a minor or of a major 
portfolio takes time. It doesn't happen like that in 10 minutes. No. It, it needs time, it must be dedicated. Sure, uh, thank you for that. One last question from me and then we can start moving to the next one. I just Please. wanted to sort of pick up on your previous experiences during the recession times. Uh, maybe you can pick the last two recessions uh, which are the closest to most people, whether they are qualified investors today or whether they were growing up and their parents were investing in the time, winning and losing. Um, uh, what, what were your winners and, and, and losers for your own uh, investment sort of career at the time of the last two recessions? Where did you and your firm win and where did you lose your clients' money at the time? Um, <laughs> This is a very nice question. Uh, let's mention, for example, the um, Crimea crisis, or let's speak about the, uh, the Fed crisis when they hiked the interest rates, or let's speak about uh, the financial crisis in 2007, or simply let's speak about the moment when the, the Swiss National Bank took off the uh, fixed uh, ratio between Swiss franc and Euro, uh, which was at 120. I think the conclusion was we uh, may have understood uh, pretty soon that something was going wrong. We had a certain um, period, pretty short, a couple of days, where we, we tried to orient, to then decide to buy more of what we already owned or to add something what in the previous crisis we could not manage to buy. Uh, I make an example. We, we, are, we, had, we have a list of uh, bonds we select where we like the balance sheet, where we like the environment, where we like the, the sector where the company is. For example, uh, Vale, it's, a, uh, it's an iron ore producer in South America, maybe one of the biggest worldwide and one of the most efficient. And they, have a, they had great bonds. There's a long bond, which we, we achieved to purchase around uh, 95, 92%. And it's now trading somewhere around 120. It was up to 130. So um, you attempted to buy maybe too much or not to buy enough because you fear it may come down again. Uh, in the composition, so return on a capital appreciation plus the uh, fixed income, and this time it is fixed and very good income, uh, it was a good deal. We may have been not aggressive enough in uh, purchasing enough stocks. Uh, this was due to a fact that uh, we are uh, privately owned asset manager, which works with the different uh, depository banks. And in those times, we did not have um, a global investment vehicle, which today we own, so that we could be fast enough to act immediately and make happy all those who are invested in this investment vehicle. Today we have it and we could benefit greatly uh, during the, the pandemic issue of 2020. Excellent. Thank you, Dirk. Um, I'll pleasure. now hand it over to Tatiana because I'm sure... Samir, allow me to say thank you to you. It's, it was a great pleasure. And uh, if I could uh, reach out to the audience and create some reasonable doubts to truly pay attention and uh, before buying, understand the best what you're going to buy in the bond market, then I'm a happy man. Pay attention. It's not over. And stay safe, guys. Thank you. Tatiana, over to you. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Samir. Um, so we have uh, around 20 minutes left, and uh, let's go to the first question. Is selective EM fixed income an, an important part of portfolios the way forward? Um, it depends essentially. <sighs> okay, we could open an afternoon on this one. I think it depends essentially uh, who is the owner of the portfolio, what is his risk cluster, and how he has been educated. If I, I explain myself, if 
the portfolio belongs to somebody who has, with all respect, done his life, he's paying pension now, he does need fixed income in some way. So he will need, presumably, a certain amount to, to live, to finance his private consumption and so on. For those, uh, risk adversity, of course, is a statement and not an opportunity. It must be safe investment and it must pay back uh, some income, so to live. Unfortunately, um, the traditional class, as discussed, doesn't work anymore. So he needs a consultant who, who shows him up what may be conservative alternatives, which presumably may add some more volatility to his portfolio, but can create an income which may become similar to what he was used to receive on, uh, from the bonds. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you finished? Sorry. <laughs> so we can move to another question then, right? Yeah, please. Thank you. So um, the question from Alessandro. Uh, in different currencies, sometimes fixed interest is more attractive in terms of interest. There is, of course, the rise problems of country risk and uh, vol uh, volatility, but the, the actual product, uh, like derivatives, can help investors. Okay, efficiency. Um, uh, I think it's a great point, and uh, it's a point I mentioned as many others. I, I, I forgot to mention it during my 12 minutes. Uh, of course, there are uh, many categories which may work still, but each of them has certain risks of volatility but i made a mistake in saying it has risks it has volatility and then it depends if volatility is a friend of yours or not i love volatility without volatility no life okay many people hate volatility because it creates them uh, bad feelings i love volatility because of opportunities it's going to give us now if I go in, uh, in uh, local bonds in emerging markets, especially if I stay in, uh, the, uh, in the government environment, I think that I have true chances to make a good return if I accept two facts. One, I don't lose my nerves if uh, things become really hard. So volatility spikes and uh, hopefully uh, the underlying currency of the local bond uh, is not going to implode. I make an example. Investing in Turkey was a great deal, especially if done in, if in, if done in Turkish lira bonds, state bonds, government bonds. But if your return is consumed by the depreciation of Turkish lira, then you have a problem because the net net is only risk. So you have to find the, the right vehicle where within the vehicle, this um, risk is limited or partially hedged. If you hedge it all, as markets are efficient, you don't make a competitive advantage to your investment. Thank you. And let's move to another question. Thanks very much, Mr. Klisch, for the presentation. Very insightful. Mario Santos, equity analyst at the Paris-based Funk speaking. I wonder how, if you foresee a disorderly change of the uh, current investment regime, and how would that be? Uh, how would that be? Uh, which asset classes will benefit and which will do poorly? By this, I mean uh, there may come a time when people just don't want to take equity volatility risk as a substitution for ne negative yielding fixed income. Where do those people go? Which assets class they buy, and how violent the move could be? Thanks a lot. Interesting. And it brings us back to the analysis, the base analysis and the base understanding of what the fund or the investor or the insurance may accept as risk. If 
the maximum allowed by law or by internal rulings or by feeling of the private investor is that he does not want to have more than 40% of stocks and he may have uh, some um, tailor-made bond solutions through pl private placements and he may have some uh, diversification into hedge funds and some um, real estate investment trusts he may simply enhance his cash. And uh, again, don't get me wrong, I'm not cynic, but in certain moments of life, I prefer to pay some debt interest on my cash account instead of being exposed to whatsoever kind of risk. But by the way, if you stay in, in equity markets, you can hedge yourself, they are pretty efficient uh, ETFs or uh, hedging strategies which do work pretty well so that depending once again on, uh, on uh, how smart the consultant may result, it can be done. It must not be done, but it can be done. But don't forget, in the meantime, you're hedged and the markets are, are dancing rock and roll, you go, you're going to go ahead in cashing in dividends. <coughs> Thank you very much. And the next question is, in your view, uh, is there or can be a knowledge problem for the analyst on the actual situation? They scored fixed income more, more or less in the same way uh, in the last 20 years. Today they need to score high yield bond in a certain way another investment club. So are they ready and prepared to analyze and manage that kind of assets in, uh, and the risk involved? No. Thank you. <laughs> No, sorry, this, this was arrogant. <laughs> it's not my style. But the short answer is no. I think I know a couple of uh, old fashioned uh, credit analysts. And uh, they, over time, stepped away from investment grade to high yield bond analysis. And uh, it's not easy because the dynamics in this segment are different. And um, the, uh, the attitude of having leveraged three, four, five times of the balance sheet does not make things easier for an analyst. And uh, on the other hand, many credit analysts from the, old, from the old school simply went into pension in retirement, okay? And uh, some of the youngers uh, never ever saw a crisis. And, and this is amazing that um, uh, there are many, many analysts, many also uh, fund managers, which have learned what it means to be hurt by volatility. Nevertheless, it comes into the bond or in the equity system. So it, it's complex because the, uh, the human being has this uh, hurt acting, okay? If somebody sells, everybody sells. Only few try not to sell, to await, to understand better, or to buy, okay? And, and this normally enhances all, all negative trends as well as it does enhance positive trends, which we see time being in the equity market. Thank you very much. So now we have lost 10 minutes and I would, uh, I would suggest for Samir to give a last statement and maybe some last answer to Dirk and Dirk will answer the, the question and we finish. Okay. Um, thank you, Tatiana. Dirk, very insightful. Um, I, I'm still kind of uh, considering, uh, you know, we, we get lots of questions about uh, one, why we do these uh, talks, uh, two, you know, what differentiates, I've seen one of the questions, so what differentiates Mayfair Investment Club to many investment clubs. Uh, and, uh, you know, I came up with an idea about a year ago uh, to create something that has a, a very nurturing environment because uh, there's so many young individuals, especially second and third generation, uh, you know, family office um, kids who go to some of the best universities in the world. They come out, they go into investment banking, they go back and, and work for the family uh, office or family business. Uh, but... Uh, Having spoken to many of them over the years, I've realized that actually what would really help uh, their 
investment or invest the mind would be in the environment that would really guide them through the process. Because um, if you grow up around a very strong and powerful father and grandfather, uh, in particular, or parents and grandparents who are incredibly busy to uh, spend much time with you. So they actually end up uh, putting you through the best schools in the world, but not really giving you much of the guidance about life, about business, and they have a certain expectations and you have certain expectations back. You find yourself in no man's land, uh, whereby you are deemed by everyone as a privileged kid, but you have your internal struggles and conflicts that really often send you in the wrong direction and you end up meeting the wrong people who take uh, a sort of abuse their power, their relationship with you. You end up wasting lots of time and money and energy and often life uh, to prove yourself to your uh, parents and grandparents that you actually amount to something. So you know, why we decided to do the club that is going to be not just about the investment portfolios that they will commit to, but it'll be also about the education and, and, and sort of guidance how to go on about it. And also, uh, you know, the importance of the due diligence on the people you invest with, because everyone just under uh, a sort of um, uh, minds the due diligence process or undervalues it in some way. And I'm a great believer that those that have nothing to hide have got everything to show and they have no problems with you doing that. So kind of uh, uh, in a way, your involvement and your openness and your, I would say a non-diplomatic uh, a sort of uh, straight talking attitude is very much uh, also what, what supports our own ethos and beliefs that uh, if you play an open book in life, uh, if you're transparent with people, if you are doing it with the right values, you achieve a long-term success, even though you might have short-term uh, sort of failures in the process. But Absolutely. overall, balanced out, you actually win. So, you know, uh, how, what would you tell young uh, investors that are looking for infrastructures, they're looking for investment clubs, they're looking for professionals, that will not just take their money and tell them to kind of go away until the money has matured, but they will really kind of take them under their wings and really kind of show them the way and give them the confidence, the knowledge transfer and the courage that they can amount to something and they don't necessarily need to remain in the shadow of their father or grandfather. I, I, I would start to say this one. The uh, academic education, is very important, but the, uh, the cycle of apprending, of learning, starts when you finish at university, because then you are in true life. And then you are to try to transform your theoretical knowledge into all those components which you have to discover, you have to live, you have to act with the correct spirit, and you have to solve the problems in a very practical, not a theoretical manner. And this is, simply speaking, considered to be the experience of life. And this must be consumed. It cannot be learned. And to consume it, the best way, I think, is be allowed to make mistakes. Of course, don't drive 300 in Monte Carlo and expect not to kill yourself, but try to make mistakes, which you can repair yourself, but out of them, you will learn many lessons for your longer life. And so the accumulation of these mistakes will allow you to work out certain perceptions. This is for me the first, the, the most important, and uh, that you are very wealthy or not. Stay with both feet on earth. Don't be arrogant. Try to be open. Try to accept critics. 
try to allow people who have a proven track record, both side, educational wise, and also lived life experience, working experience, to correct yourself. Allow them to speak open with you. All the others, you don't need them because you are not going to post to learn from them. Thank you. Sorry, Dave. again, very direct. I, the yeah. diplomatic thing, I don't like it. I, I really appreciate, I mean, I, I'm not the most diplomatic person, uh, not in the sense of uh, uh, wanting ever to upset people, but just I think uh, sometimes the harsh uh, reality and the tough love is the best way to teach others because I, I, that, that's how I grew up, you know, my, my parents, grandparents, my, my mentors uh, always taught me the right things from the wrong things. As, as you said, I had to learn uh, sometimes hard way and sometimes hard way isn't uh, necessarily the, the sort of uh, the bad way to learn because you really pick up uh, the sort of experience in that way. But on that, on that subject, could I ask you what's been the most valuable uh, mistake or, or, or sort of failure you've personally experienced that's taught you more than any other one? The biggest failure I had in my life, Samir, on this one I have to think because there are several issues which if I could most probably I, I, would, uh, I would change. But I must see that I am a very privileged person because with all the mistakes I've committed, I have reached a, a great goal. I had a great, a great uh, education. I had great mentors at uh, UBS in my previous experience in the investment banking. I had uh, great teachers from in the, in the stock market and in the bond market and in the option market. I knew great people on Wall Street. They all gave me so much feedback and uh, I had uh, um, great parents, which grew me up, very open-minded, so to accept information, critics from every side. And this, at the end, avoided me to, um, to stay too arrogant for too long time and uh, become today my own boss in our company, where we just have to respond to our clients. And I would say I have reached a certain kind of um, mental, operational freedom that even with my 55 years, uh, I'm back to work over 12 hours a day. And I don't need motivation. I don't need somebody who wakes me up in the morning. And uh, this is, I think, the perfect fulfillment of a, of a life always speaking on professional life, of course. Sure. Thank you, Dirk. I would just ask my last question and Tatiana could wrap up. Um, what's the uh, a, a sort of a typical profile of your client that you deal with in terms of uh, and not who they are, but what, what would be a typical profile of somebody that invests money uh, with well, you? Um, I would say we have... Um, we don't have a concrete profile I could describe in, uh, in one profile. I would say we have many industrial people who have their true risk on the uh, economic industrial side. We have uh, many younger investors which received part of inheritance from their parents. So they received also a certain burden of fear versus investment styles. But I think the, the most complex thing is that we manage uh, investors a little bit all over the world. So we have uh, US investors, we have Canadian investors, we have European investors, private, institutional, we do external consulting. So it's, it's pretty difficult and uh, I don't want to miss out anybody, but I think this is one of the, the nicest parts of our challenge to be 
uh, pretty fast able to adapt to new client profiles, so to try to understand best what are their needs. Thank you, that's very fair. Tatiana, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk, for your inspiration talk. Thank you, Samir. You're, as usually, you're the best co-host ever. Um, so, uh, thank you, guests, for being with us and watching us. And uh, um, it was, my name is Tatiana, and I was happy to moderate this amazing meeting. And uh, see you next Friday, then, and happy, uh, have a lovely weekend, sorry. <laughs> have a lovely weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Bye, Samir. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, thank you guys. Bye-bye. Ciao, Samir. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.